We're live. Today, we have Ben Violet, who is a French-Canadian, finally migrating back over the ocean to Canada. And I met Ben about five or six years ago. Ben was super interested in nutrition and joined us for a few programs at Real Meal Revolution, not to lose weight, but to advance his own knowledge because he had been evolving over quite a while. And Ben is an insane trail runner. He used to send me pictures of him running through the Alps. And one of the things that always blew my mind he was always wearing slip slops. In South Africa, we call them slip slops. They're called flip flops, thongs in Australia. And uh, and then I, I caught on Facebook the other day that this madman ran a 24 hour race. So ran nonstop uh, for 24 hours and clocked up 180 kilometers. And the first thing I thought was, surely not in slip slops. And anyway, I looked at his post on Facebook and you wouldn't believe it, but there was a photograph of his feet. And this is what they look like. I cannot believe this. <laughs> so anyway, here's Ben. Uh, ben Violet, welcome. We're here to chat about why on earth you run in slip slops or sandals. Hey, John. It's, uh, it's nice to talk to you with, uh, with you again. It's been a while. Yeah, man. Good to have you. So, so let's get into it. What on earth with the feet, man? <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a long story, but it kind of goes essentially back to the genesis of me running. Um, and being an overweight runner, because when I started, I was overweight. Uh, and so for overweight runners, you have a lot of technology that's offered in terms of shoes. You know, you get like all yeah. sorts of support and all sorts of things. And I was trying to figure things out and it just wasn't working. To put it simple. I tried like a million different models, always getting like pain and issues and all sorts of stuff. And uh, over time, I kind of fell into all this documentation about minimal running. And it was like, hey, the rest isn't working. Might as well try this. Uh, and it was immediately better. I was like, oh, okay, this is a good way to go. So I did most of my running life in minimal footwear, but most of them were just shoes. They look like shoes, except they're really flexible. How was it better? What, what is the the meat yeah. behind minimal running? Yeah. Well, the idea is to get as close as possible to what a natural running gait would be. So typically, you know, if you think of your ancestors like running barefoot across the savannah, as close as you can get to that because that's the way the body was meant to run so it's you know ideally you try to respect it as much as possible um, and it's actually quite interesting if you are overweight or just overall heavy because you learn how to create your own shock absorption with your body uh obviously there's a learning curve it's not like it's not it's not a magic tool you just you know suddenly take your shoes off and bam you know uh, yeah. ultra marathon you know and like it doesn't work that way but um, you do learn to be a lot more efficient in your movement and no longer require a lot of padding under your foot. So I did that for years. Do you mind if we just stay on that for a second? Yeah, sure. What, is that, what does that mean for people who do run with shoes with a lot of shock absorption? Hmm. Well, there's um, one of the better ways to explain it is that um, your brain essentially manages how heavy you land. Okay, You have little to no control over this unless you consciously think about it. It's kind of like breathing. So yeah. if you're if you're on a very soft surface, and when I say soft, essentially, when you're running in big running shoes, as far as your brain knows, the ground is the inside of your shoe. Your brain can't figure out that the ground is under the shoe. Yeah, so your brain okay. is running on soft ground. Yes, well, that, that's the yeah, context. No, that makes point, perfect right? sense to me. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, um, and so you're, if you're on a soft surface, uh, you're on something that's relatively unstable. Think of, you know, walking on like... A, thick mud. It's never really yeah. stable. You kind of wobble around. Uh, well, to some extent, shoes kind of do the same thing. And so when you're doing that, your brain tries to compensate. It says, okay, this, say, this surface is soft and unstable. I'm actually going to land harder because I want to create resistance in this material in order to stabilize myself. Wow, so if okay. you, yeah, <laughs> if you want to, if you find the perfect mix, because everybody's built different, right? We have different weights, we have different gates. But if you find the perfect mix of, you know, that bit of cushioning that's going to like it's stiff enough, you know, for your weight, then you'll probably be just fine. Like there's a little range where it can kind of work. But for most people, it actually doesn't. And that's why most runners get injured like at least once a year minimum. And most of them get injured more than once. So, so would you get a plantar fasciitis from your foot kind of overcompensating all the time? That's possible. Yeah, it could be yeah. plantar fasciitis. It could be uh, shin splints. It could be um so knee issues uh and, and back problems and so on and so on like there's a whole host of problems but um it's 
a lot of them are related to the shoes, not necessarily, but uh, sometimes it's not the running shoe itself. It's the day to day shoe that causes the damage. But then when you put extra strain, you know, yeah. So here the idea is just that to, you try to work on the body. Essentially, you don't ask the shoe to do the body's job. Oh, that makes okay? sense. Yeah. And, but obviously then you have to train the body to do it because it just, you know, since you usually haven't done it most of your life, your body is untrained and your foot is untrained and your leg is untrained. So you need to build up to it. So does that mean that you kind of, so how does that affect your stride? Because most people who run like, they run duck footed and and yeah. land on like a heavy heel from like a, is it a hoka, that trail shoe that's basically like- Yeah, the very thick ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. What, what happens to the, the duck footedness then? Because that one, yeah. you can't do that. <laughs> Well, you tend, I mean, it's a little, a little bit more complicated than that, but you tend to have uh, what you would call a flat foot strike. So essentially, okay. uh, it's that you really land midfoot. So the, essentially, uh, it, it'll be the front of the foot, it'll be the first contact point, but you're actually only really loading uh, on the three points of contact of the foot. Uh, so the, the, you know, the, the foot two, yep. like essentially the limbs at the front and the heel in the back. And so that's when you really actually load uh the foot and so you're landing relatively flat-footed uh if you're slowing down you'll be heel striking because that's the best way to slow down um which is also applying more force into the ground in order to essentially lose force you're getting rid of it uh yeah. you're applying force into the ground and you're no, no longer reusing it to propel yourself and if you're accelerating you're going to be leaning forward so it's going to be a front foot strike because yeah. you're trying to put all the energy in propulsion so there's different so strides along... it doesn't matter what you're wearing yeah <laughs> Okay, so and if you're running sort of just like on the flats, cruising along, you kind of running so slap bang on the, like on, trying to use the whole pretty foot much flat, basically. yeah, pretty much the whole foot just landing flat. As I said, like the okay. first actual contact point is the front of the foot, but it would be uh, a, a mistake to call it a uh, forefoot strike okay. because it's you're really only loading on the whole foot, so it'd be a midfoot strike. Is it is a toe strike the same as a forefoot strike? Yeah, that's it. Okay. So, so now we can go back to the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, anyways, I figured, I figured that worked better for me. Um, okay. I, it took a while to adapt. Um, and you know, over time, that's just how I ran, but I, I did experiment a lot. I mean, I used, uh, I used some more cushion shoes. I used some more minimal shoes. Uh, you know, I used a bit of everything. I was just trying to figure things out because there's not, there's not really a guidebook for this. Like there's, there's the, um, there's the barefoot ayatollahs, you know, it's like everything barefoot all the way. Uh, or there's the cushion ayatollahs, which is like, if there's no cushion, you will actually die. Um, you know, and so there's no real middle ground. And plus, I mean, I'm not the lightest person in the world. So also the things I'm wearing are often not. So to give a perspective, I weigh over 200 pounds, over 90 kilos. Well, like right um, now, today. Yeah. But you're and clean, I, are you really tall? I'm a meter 85. That's like okay. six foot. So I'm yeah. not like super tall, but I am a bit stocky. Um, just like naturally built like that. And, um, and so I've always been relatively heavy. So when I, when you do get uh, a gear, it's often, con you know, especially higher end gear, they're thinking of yeah. athletes that are going to be like in the 75 to maybe top 80 kilo range, Little maybe 85, yeah. but like yeah. 95, no way. Like the, that equipment's just not meant for that kind of weight. And it's also not necessarily meant for those kind of, the kind of distances I do. So sure. but that came later. But so the idea is that, you know, I played around for years and years and years and eventually just kind of found sandals just because I'd, I'd heard of them and I was like, ah, what the hell? I'll give that a try. That looks funny. Um, and it turns out it was the best experience ever. Uh, I was like, wow, this is incredible. I get, I get adequate foot protection. Uh, my feet are pretty wide. So they also, I'd had no like space issues and it just kind of worked. So yeah, that's what typically what they would look like. And, and so is this like your special pair or is this just the kind of, I mean, is there a brand in particular or are there loads of different brands of this sandal? Cause this is the only pair, not just <laughs> like the only brand, literally the yeah. only pair I've ever seen. So it doesn't, they yeah. can't be like a listed company, you know? <laughs> so I don't think there's any listed companies to do this, but there is yeah. actually a whole bunch of brands that do uh, so minimal style sandals like this. Yeah. So this is the, uh, what they call the Huarachi sandal, which actually okay. just means sandal in Spanish, by the way. Um, wow. But it's it's often used as a, like, you know, a, a name from. 
So they, they have the strap in, in the middle of the toe, but you'll also see different styles. Uh, and you have like American brands uh, that do it. Uh, these ones are from a brand called Penta Sandals, who I work with. Yeah. Um, and they're a, uh, a company based out of the Netherlands. And they've been making my sandals for what, over a year or so, maybe. I can't remember. And so do you need to get these? I've got a few questions about them just in general. So yeah, go ahead. the first thing that strikes me is that the places of discomfort that sh that yeah. would like immediately frustrate me is that this would pull against my webbing yeah. and that this would really feel tight against my Achilles. What is it? Yeah. Or, yeah. What does it feel like? So uh, first of all, so in between the toes, if you're not used to wearing anything between your toes, your skin is essentially brand new, right? So it's never yeah. really had any contact with it. So that's going to take a little bit of time to adjust to. But it's really no big deal. It's like you maybe you might have to put a little bit of anti rub cream on it, you know, like those anti chafing creams you get for running. Might yeah. put a little bit of that on, essentially lube up um, yeah. for the, you know, maybe first couple of weeks. And eventually your skin just kind of strengthens itself. Okay. Um, so it doesn't, it won't really be vulnerable. Uh, I used to have to put cream on all the time, and now I just go and do races without them. So I'm fine now, but I wear that, sandals that all, all the time. Yeah. So do you wear them? Do you wear them when you're not running as well? Yeah, I have a, a essentially where the sandal is on my foot. There, I have a tan line. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I kid Got you it. not. <laughs> and that knot doesn't bother you. So that's actually uh, it's relatively flat, so it doesn't really get in the way. And what you're seeing there, that top strap is a, a technical strap we use for trail running. Uh, okay. On the road versions, I actually don't even have that, and I actually I don't even use it at all now. So. Wow. It's okay. it's an extra piece of comfort. Uh, if you really want to hold the sandal into place, uh, I would recommend it for like, you know, essentially like a very rainy day where your foot might move around a bit more. Okay. But so, you don't necessarily need it. So now you use these slops, so sandals to, is it kind of like a meditation that it reminds you of where you've come from? Because mm -hmm. does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I kind of see what you mean. I mean, there there is the idea that you're using like the most simple piece of apparatus. Um, yeah. And also there is a real sense of connection. Like when I'm running through like pebbles, like I can feel them kind of bouncing off my foot and stuff. And like, you know, it doesn't hurt. It's a pebble, you know. Um, I'm not slamming into rocks or anything. But so you kind of feel that extra connection. Uh, mm -hmm. You can also like you, you'll run right through a river and you don't care. It's just a river. I mean, you know, it's like, it's yeah. not, it's not a deep river, whatever. And, and you see other people in their shoes kind of like tiptoeing through it. And you're like, dude, it's water, you know, <laughs> squidging in their socks for like yeah. half an hour afterwards as well. Yeah. Whereas your foot will dry out. I mean, there's like, there, there are some like this kind of connection side to things. It's kind of cool. Uh, but mostly I just, I have, I really stuck to it because it's really only all that worked for me. Um, it was the only way that I could get sufficient protection uh, for the technical, so I really came to it for trail running. In road running, it didn't really matter. I could pretty much work with anything, but in trail running, it was the only way I could get like really enough protection underfoot, uh, yeah. while still having like a very wide platform. And there's just the shoes just didn't cut it. Like I have yeah. shoe options for road running, but in trail running, just it does nothing works for me. So that that interests me with the trail running thing because I don't really find I need like protection when i'm trail running as much as i need like a firm grip like yeah. i find that i need a really hard shoe so i agree with you by mm. the way on the sensation thing i hate a soft shoe i like to feel everything mm. um but when i'm when i'm trail running like i mean when i run in the forest near my house it's like slippery as anything and so mm. i need grip and then i need something that can withstand like landing on awkward shapes so does because yeah. i imagine with this it's quite thin so I'm, i imagine your your foot kind of like bends around whatever you you hit. Well, it's actually not as thin as you think. It looks okay. thin because my foot's just huge. But right. <laughs> it's actually they're actually relatively thick. There's a there's a good you're probably working with a good centimeter plus of okay. really dense uh really dense foam. Uh so it's it's like a very they're very hard at first. They take a while to like, you know, work at work in and uh, get more okay. flexible. So you actually get a, that's what I call by protection is that yeah. if you, if you were to step, let's say on a rock smaller than the surface of your foot and it would push on the one side, you're going to feel the push, but you won't necessarily feel that sharp edge. So as long as your foot is flexible enough, it'll kind of adapt to it and it'll kind of flex around it. 
but you won't get that sharp poke where you're gonna go like ow <laughs> yeah, yeah i got it so, so that's that's kind of the idea cool so take us back to why running is such a big thing you were telling us before we mm -hmm. came online or telling me at least that it's yeah. kind of eight years before your your run and running is yeah. quite a significant part of a, a bigger transformation mm. R running was actually my it was kind of my my motor um so when i was about 25 uh i was so very much overweight i was at 120 kilos approximately um and actually, I don't know how high I went because I stopped weighing myself after a certain point because it's just fucking humiliating. You know, you look yeah. at yourself in the mirror and you go like, I'm disgusting. And then you get on the scale and the scale says, well, yeah, you are. And, uh, and so you <laughs> yeah. feel terrible. And, and you say, well, I'm not going to have this conversation anymore. <laughs> and you just stop yep. checking. But I essentially was around 120 at my highest. And uh, I was smoking about a pack a day. Um, and I had been uh, for at least 10 years at that point. And, um, and I, I drank quite a bit. Uh, and obviously, we're not talking about kombucha here. We're talking about alcohol. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't really fully fledged into alcoholism yet. But let's just put it this way. If alcohol wasn't available when I wanted it, I would get pretty angry. So mm. it, it shows that there is that kind of dependency. Yeah. And so at 25, uh, I was realizing that, well, I was only about 10 years away from when my father had his first heart attack. And he passed away at age 50 from his second uh, with roughly the same situation, smoking, drinking, overweight. So I was like, okay, I'm 10 years out and kind of feeling like not feeling too great. And yet at 18, I'd been all right. Like, you know, I was still pretty skinny, uh, pretty athletic, but it really just gone seriously downhill. And I was like, do I have 10 years? Like, you, yeah. know, you start to ask yourself those questions. And so... I like to hike a lot and I was thinking, Hey, you know, I want to feel fitter when I go hiking. So let's try running because it's one thing I could do at home. I lived in Paris, you know, there's not much hiking in Paris. So, uh, I went to the gym, got on the mat, started running. And it's like, at first I could only do 10 minutes. I was like, this is weird. Cause I can only run 10 minutes here. Yet when I go hiking, I seem to be able to hike like three days in a row and no problem. And so it's by starting to try to problem solve the running. It's like, why can I not run? Like, that I, yeah. got, you know, started to think about the whole shoe thing. And then you're like, oh my God, I discovered this magical thing. <laughs> it's like, a, you know, less shoe. Suddenly I feel so much more athletic and it kind of like drives you. Yeah. Um, so, and it really became kind of like that motor. It just, it became a social thing too. Cause I would, I would go and run with people uh, after a while. It took a couple of years to get to that, but still, you know, like once I built the confidence, it's like, oh, I can go run with people and not get dropped. Uh, started running with groups that helped my social life, you know, like, it, like the whole thing just really stems from one day I went into a gym, I tried to run on a mat. I had a target goal of 10 minutes. I didn't make it. It got, it pissed me off and I had to figure out why. And, and from that point on, I was uh, trying to problem solve it. And as I pr tried, tried to problem solve it, I just got hooked. And, um, yeah. cause it and felt that, good too. Like every single time you solve it with a little problem, you're like, Oh, I feel so good, you know, and you're happy. Yeah. And every time you run, I think like, even if you have like a bad run, it's difficult to feel like properly depressed afterwards. You can be irritated, yeah. like, uh, you know, bad time or whatever, but generally mm. like exercise is the tonic. Um, yeah, that's it. And so what happened after that? So, so just tell me about like the, so did you just decide like I hereby quit drinking and smoking and everything and will now be a health icon or did you decide mm. to, to run first and then realize it wasn't, they weren't, they couldn't live together? I think, I think the food, kind of happened around the same time but a little bit later it just it just came a little bit later but it was like it's the same mindset you just you know you're you're dealing with one issue at a time but i was essentially you know contemplating the fact that i was overweight and i was like okay what can i do food wise and somebody in my in my in my cir circle of friends had said you know well we did this kind of atkins style thing so essentially it's really easy you just don't eat any carbs that's yes. the only, that was the that was the only guideline I had, by the way. It's just don't eat carbs. I was like, okay, I, I guess I can do that. And so I was like, so what has carbs? Oh, shit, all that stuff. And I was like, that's a lot of stuff. I was like, okay, but like then I the whole of really, France basically. Yeah, <laughs> you and can't was, eat in France then, anymore. <laughs> but it was okay because it was like you can have meats and vegetables. I was like, well, I like meats and vegetables. That's fine with me. And so I gave it a go, and I got that you know that super encouraging like. You, when you first start keto because it, it yeah. turned out i did full-on keto without even knowing it um 
like I said, my only guideline was just don't eat carbs. Um, I'd lost eight kilos in two weeks because, you know, yeah. you're losing all that water weight and you're yeah. like, wow, this is great. I feel so much better, you know, uh, except then you realize that your waistline hasn't really moved. But <laughs> but that, you know, you figure out later. Yeah. Well, that's not always the case. Mm. I mean, um, yeah, of course. You know, some people lose like everything. They just all of a sudden feel mm. slimmer. But anyway, that's OK. So that's incredible. And then mm. um, and then after that you progressed into trying to help people so what i don't know is what happened with your career because you're now a coach and we'll talk more about that just now but what were you doing and then how did you change a transition across so i was working in advertising at the time um i had been i'd been working for uh philip morris uh nike (laughs) um and a couple of food brands as well so i mean so essentially all all the places i had problems with uh, so it also became, uh, looking at my own lifestyle, it became complicated to go and sell those things afterwards. Mm. Uh, not that I was doing the actual sales, but you know, you're like, I'm working on this and yet I disagree with what's being done. Um, and so eventually it kind of created a shift and some people were seeing me just get healthier and started asking questions and without knowing it, you're now becoming a mentor. But like yeah. you're just answering questions, just saying like, oh, well, I did this and that. Oh, you should try this store. They have these kind of shoes. Or maybe you should try this and maybe you should, you know. And after a while, you're like, this feels like a bit of a coaching mentor slash relationship. And you're like, huh, and this is fun. I'm, I'm enjoying this. Like, I'm, I'm actually spending more time thinking about this in my day than I am speaking, spending, spend, spending thinking about my work. Wow. So, and plus, you know, you're feeling this shift in your work and you're kind of like, okay, well, I don't really, I'm not really interested in this anymore. Um, and on the other hand, there's this kind of side hobby that seems to appear that I'm really enjoying. Mm. And so it was like, okay, how can I make this a career? It took a while to really figure out. I mean, you know, when, when we were working together, uh, like on the training part, it was really just, I was still at the very beginning of it. I didn't even really know. I was like, am I doing like sports coaching, health coaching? Like, what am I doing? But it took a while to shape. Um, but that's, that's really how it came about. It's just, uh, just helping people around you, you know, it's just answering questions. And, and eventually you're like, Hey, maybe, maybe I could make a living out of this. Cause it seems like, you know, it's interesting. The coaching thing. I think a lot of people don't understand coaching the way, well, I didn't understand it either. You know, I, mm. I thought like if you're a, so you do get sports coaches who literally give you a plan until you to follow it. Yeah. But in general, when you want to coach, you, you want someone to help you execute. And, yeah. and I think that's totally different, you know, like, mm. I could, if I didn't know anything about nutrition and all I had was like the banting food lists, I could still mm. coach. And I, and I don't know if that's been your experience as well. Like most people who mm. want to make a change don't really have an issue with the theory. It's actually an issue with like the execution. Yeah. What's in the way of them executing on the theory? Is that, I mean, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, I think that, I think there's a, a lot. So there's there's essentially when you look at people that are trying to work on their health, there's really two groups. There's those that want a guidebook, and they some of the some of these people want somebody to read the guidebook to them essentially, yeah. um, and explain it and answer a question. So they do want that technical knowledge, um, and then there's those that are like you said, they really just want to work on the execution. So they they've understood how it worked. They might have the odd question, but that's you know just kind of beside the point because they could go elsewhere to get the answer uh mm-hmm. but it's really about working on the motivation and it, what is complicated is that the word coach is it tends to be uh, associated with the, these two types of people yeah uh, so you'll and uh, actually the best sport coaches are the ones that help you on execution by the way uh they yeah. might give you a training plan but they're really just helping you stay accountable and i think those are the best sport coaches so even in the uh, sports coaching world it applies as well so totally. i think you know even though, yeah, when it comes to health coaching, I think you need a bit of both. You need a little bit of technical know-how, uh, or at least some general understanding. So you have to be able to help, you know, guide people along. But they do have to make their own decisions. So, like you said, like there is. That's why I talk about mentoring as well. Mentoring is a different thing. I think that you need to, in some fields. So, so typically in running, uh, I find that you need a little bit of mentoring. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to things like. Uh, ultra distance running uh where it's all about problem solving and somebody that's already solved a problem well might be able to help avoid you spending five years figuring it figuring it out so you know yeah. like that that can be interesting it's like oh you're getting that kind of problem well that's actually very simple this is the issue uh and then like here are the solutions i've found or that i know of that's mentoring it's not coaching 
right? Yeah, got it. But then, you know, get it's sticking to you and saying like, hey, have you gotten that thing to solve that problem yet? Yeah. Like, where are you at on that? That's the coaching part. And that's important too. Yeah, vital. I, I often wish I had someone like who would stand next to my bed and blow a whistle at like, <laughs> at like five in the morning. You know, when someone's standing there watching you, even at the gym, like I find mm. someone's watching me, like you can just push 10 times harder when there's someone breathing over your shoulder. It would be so great yeah. to have someone like that all the way. But anyway, I want to talk about nutrition. So you said that you yep. were doing keto. One of the things I think a lot of people battle with is keto and sports performance. So mm. where are you at with that and how do carbs fit in or fats or yeah. ketones or exogenous ketones? Yeah, yeah. Well, at first, uh, so at first it was really all about the weight loss. So it didn't really matter what it gave, what it gave in terms of uh, performance. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Dr. Phil Maffetone, um, yeah. who's a, just a, an absolute legend when it comes to uh, uh, to sports, uh, sports performance and sports nutrition as well, even though it's not his core field initially, but actually I think he's initially, he was like a family practice doctor or something like that, but he, you know, he became a specialist. Um, and so this was mostly low intensity training. So the good thing is if you're on a low carb diet, especially when you're beginning and you're, you know, you're not quite keto adapted. And, uh, so you're still struggling with intensity, uh, following a low intensity training protocol is just absolutely perfect. Uh, because you're never really going into that high zone and you don't get like, you don't essentially get big, uh, like blood sugar drops, you know, from high intensity training. So it was actually relatively easy, uh, at first. So those first couple of years, it was really just working, like, you know, getting the fitness up and, you know, losing weight through the diet. On the other hand, when I started to get into trail running, uh, trail running as those who practice it might, would already know. Uh, has big variations in rhythm. So typically you're cruising along at a pretty easy pace, then comes a hill. And even though you're slowing down, the intensity itself goes way up because now yeah. you're fighting gravity. And so in trail running, I suddenly kind of, kind of hit a limit. It was like, it was, it became really hard to do like a big, big push up a mountain because we're not talking hills here. The I used to, I was going in the Alps and the Alps are pretty steep. So you know, you can have like this 1,500 meter climb, which is a lot, you know, in over one like, sitting. yeah, in one block. Uh, that was actually how I first figured out that I had a problem, <laughs> but <laughs> it's just, that I is, was on this, I was on this that race like that had this, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> no, it's absolutely crazy. And you can think of it, that might not even be the top of the mountain because some of them over there are way bigger than that. And even so if you you're starting like from one, like, that's one climb one hill, in a, one in, climb, in a yeah. portion of a race, or is that like yeah. a whole race? No, in, in in the portion of a race, uh, I've, I've that's the longest I've I think I've had maybe like one thousand five hundred. Uh, actually, no, I, I have done worse. I've done one thousand eight, but it's just that these climbs are so long, um, and it doesn't matter if they're steep or not steep, right? That's not so much the point. It's just so much elevation where you're always pushing against gravity for like hours and hours and hours, um, and you you essentially run out of glycogen. So yep. you're now running on empty when it comes to glycogen. But the thing is that the intensity of the effort, just because of the, the elevate, sorry, the gradient means that you're actually still trying to tap into that. And I found that in those situations, well, it took me a while to figure out, but eventually understood that, okay, I needed to trickle in some carbs there to really like kind of help me along. Um, and it took again, a long time to figure out what kind of carbs and, you know, like how to work it how to work through it. Cause at first, you know, you just like, what happens if I have like a tiny sip of sports drink? Well, first of all, it's disgusting, but you know, <laughs> and yeah. then it turns out it doesn't really work. Um, then, you know, try like slower carbs. Oh, okay. I can't digest them. Cause you know, like it just takes so much time. Uh, and so eventually it, it was more like, okay, so very simple carbs and very small quantities. Um, it's come down to the point where I just essentially take like applesauce with me and that's like yeah. my sports gel. Uh, like um like with your roast just pork, applesauce. applesauce yeah yeah like applesauce and you just take the stuff out the jar or do you well no i don't i don't have the jar i, I buy them in little pouches because they do they make them they make them in little pouches for babies um so you i can literally buy this in any supermarket you can just get a little yeah, yeah. applesauce pouch and that's like if ever you're really like on these really really long efforts and you you, you can feel it like your body kind of gives you those signals like hey we're running out of juice here 
Um, well, you can essentially bring some in. Uh, I've even occasionally had the odd, like, you know, the odd little, like, chewy candy kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but I, those, those make, those are my worst out of everything out there, yeah. like the chewy gums. They, make oh, no, not, not gum, like, just like, uh, what do you call them? Like, like jelly babies and stuff like that. Like that's just what soft I mean. Candy, yeah, the, right? yeah, the soft jelly sweets. Sorry, not mm. chewing gum, gum, but like we yeah. call them gum, we call them gummy bears. Yeah, like stuff like bears that. Gummy bears and jelly. But bears. The, those have worked for me because you can get like very small quantities, and essentially yeah. it's a very easy to understand quantity. It's like the I think it's what five grams per candy or something like that. You get five grams of sugar, but it's very simple sugar, and it digests immediately. So in the middle of an effort, it kind of makes sense. But yeah. you don't want to like you don't want to pop like five in a row because then you're going to get a huge spike, right? The apple okay. sauce is usually a bit better, but it's also harder to digest. So it depends yeah. what you're doing. Like uh, I've done it in situations where it's like I'm kind of doing like a end of race sprint, uh, and yeah. sprint is relative. Like when you've done a hundred kilometers, like sprinting is actually quite slow. But it's a big effort. <laughs> but it feels <laughs> it feels like you're going fast, but you're not. <laughs> And in that case, you're you're no longer able to digest because you're essentially you're you're taking up so many re so much resource uh, in the movement that you can't the applesauce just doesn't work because yeah. it does require even though it's easy to digest it requires a bit of effort. So that's when like these very simple sugars in small quantities are actually interesting because they do give that little something because they go right into your bloodstream. It's pretty much like you might as well have a needle and just shoot it into your arm like it's the same thing. Uh, there's like zero digestive effort. <laughs> and do you go, um, are you in ketosis all the time? Or so would you like start a race in mm. ketosis and then finish kind of waiting to go back in? Actually, I don't think I ever draw, really drop out because uh, of ketosis because I really don't eat that much carbs at all during any race. Um, and if I do, it might just be like a little while and then essentially I'll just go back into ketosis. But the thing is, the effort is such that any blood that enters your bloodstream is just absorbed immediately by your muscles. There's really, yeah. I mean, I have tested my blood sugars. Um, I've never actually done keto tests, like ketone tests during an, uh, an effort because it's just too complicated. Um, <laughs> but I have, on the other hand, tried with a, uh, so a blood sugar monitor and it, my it's the most boring game ever. I just watched this line stay completely flat and barely even move. And the only thing, the only thing that actually does happen is that sometimes it drops a bit low. Is that a and patch or, a, or an implant? Yeah, those, um, the, uh, you know, the little readers, uh, the, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, super sapiens things is the one I tried because I like they gave, they, they were giving them out for trial. So I gave it a go and I, I was in the Alps. And so I said, hey, let's go do stuff. And and after, and I was like taking screenshots of the app thinking like, okay, I'll keep these for future reference. And then I looked at all the screenshots and I was like, I can't tell which one is which because I didn't write it down because I didn't know which one was a night's sleep and which one was me going up the mountain nearby. It was like, okay, this is pointless because you get, you still get really stable blood sugars. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, I just always hear about people saying, if you cut out carbs, you're going to like, you're going to just your blood sugar is going to go totally out of whack. And it's almost like the opposite. It's like when you add in. No, carbs, it's super it's stable. It's crazy. Hmm. Wow. Okay. And so let's, can we talk about um, coaching, like the kind of clients that you coach now yeah. and you know, what your plan is? Cause at the time of shooting, you're yeah. basically on your way out of France and back to Canada. Yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm currently still in France, but I'm, I'm moving to Vancouver. Um, yeah. So the, the type of, actually I've worked with a pretty wide range of clients and I've really, but I have an interest my, in, like I've focused my interest on really two categories, uh, people that have are essentially in chronic, in situations of chronic illness, like, you know, large, like heavy, uh, like, you know, obesity, diabetes, uh, I mean, diabetes is a, has a personal focus for me cause, uh, well, I'm pretty well versed in it. Um, partly cause my wife is type one diabetic. So yeah. there is that interest in diabetes in general and understanding the mechanism behind it. Although type one and type two are very different things. Mm. Do understand a little bit better how type two works from witnessing type one every day and obviously helping people with type one because technically my first client was my wife. <laughs> yeah. So, and it was like how to figure that out, you know, uh, how do you become an athlete? uh with type while, while while having type 1 diabetes how do you learn to master type 1 diabetes because you can it can happen very late in life and you can be like hey i just got diagnosed what does this do for my life like do i need to like live on sugar now well maybe you don't um and and on the other end of the spectrum i've been i've been working with people that are 
athletes already and that are trying to improve that. And so there is kind of a mix of a bit of sports coaching, a bit of nutritional coaching, you know, so on one end, you have people that are trying to get into it and people they're trying to yeah. fine tune. So I kind of like either the let's get started, the big broad strokes. Um, and on the other hand, on the other hand, also like this kind of like my new, you know, my new shut to detail. It's like, okay, so let's see, like, so let's try like taking the carbs down by 10 grams a day and see what happens. And, you know, uh, or let's do like these really weird protocols. It's like, okay, let's try a, you know, like anti-inflammation protocol for like two weeks and see like how, you know, how the numbers check out. And it, it, I like that too. It's fun. But yeah, I think I it's also it good like, to have the uh, intuitive side. Totally. Well, and where can people find you for coaching? I'll type it into the comments now and then you can. Yeah, actually uh, the easiest way is to just uh, send out an email or reach, reach out to me on East Instagram. So that's uh, b.vilo, V-I-O-L-O-T, uh, at gmail.com or just uh, Instagram or Facebook, Ben Viello. So okay, pretty cool. easy to find. Spun out into the comments everywhere. Boom, 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 boom. Cool. <laughs> ben you legend. I can't believe that you did that thing in flip-flops. I have bought it. I'm buying what you're selling, by the way. I <laughs> I think it's fascinating. I'm I'm like tempted to, in my mind, all the excuses are showing up. No, it's cold. It's yeah. wet. It's winter. It's Cape Town. But it, yeah. it, you, you, you have a compelling argument for minimalist running. Hey, you, you have no excuse. Out. I ran in sandals <laughs> in snow back in March, okay? Yeah, that's so badass. Man. You have no excuse on the weather. <laughs> I was wearing socks and, and you know, let's, <laughs> but still you can, I'm not saying yeah, it's the best thing to do, but you can, <laughs> yeah, but you can't wear socks and slip slops in, in Cape Town. That, that'll be the, you know, you got to maintain <laughs> that'll be the end of your <laughs> social standing. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, Ben, it was great chatting to you. Thanks so much for giving hey, up your time likewise. and um, yeah, safe travels back home and all the best. So if you want to reach out to Ben, chat about coaching, be Go at violet, yeah, violet at gmail.com otherwise check out the comments for more links thanks so much ben keep it real man thanks jono take care